Okay, um, let's start. Uh, our first talk uh, would be the keynote um, talk from uh, Professor Stefan uh, Mala. Um, he's, uh, um, he's a professor um, uh, in applied mathematics, uh, math sorry, mathematics uh, at the College de France. And also uh, I believe uh, in call, sorry, normal, uh, I can't I can't pronounce it correctly. Uh, sorry, um, and he has uh, many contributions to the uh, to the field. Uh, I think most notably uh, on the um, wavelet theory. Actually, um, well, from my first introduction to wavelet was actually from uh, uh, Dr. Malas' uh, YouTube video, uh, which is he gave it a lecture I think uh, in 2020. Um, and uh, he has won many uh, notable awards. Uh, I think uh, uh, one of the um, best known one is the uh, the Prix uh, Blaise Pascal Award, I believe, uh, and also many other awards. Um, so uh, today he, he's going to give us a talk uh, on multi-scale random models for deep neural networks. Uh, Dr. Mello, um, yeah. um, um, Floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. So yes, I'll be speaking about these black boxes of deep networks that we all want to open. So that will be towards the opening of trying to understand uh, why they work so well. And uh, the talk will... Oops. Okay, so I'll be uh, speaking uh, about, uh, of course, high dimensional learning and both sides of high dimensional learning. In other words, uh, unsupervised learning, where the problem is to estimate the probability distribution of the data, which belongs to a very high dimensional space, typically of dimension D, which is very large, that you estimate from, uh, from examples. And uh, data generation by sampling is, of course, one important application. So here you see examples coming from physics where you would like to be able to do that from potentially very few examples. But of course, you have uh, examples coming from internet, for example, faces. And there we've seen in the recent years uh, the remarkable result obtaining from score diffusion. And in the case of score diffusion, the key point is that you have to be able to learn the score. In, or, in other words, the gradient of the log probability. And this is a very high dimensional function that will be the central difficulty. Now, in supervised learning, you have another type of function that you want to learn, which is the function that gives you the label of the data y from the example, in this case, it's supervised. And here again, you are facing this uh, difficulty, which is to estimate a function in very high dimension. So we have these remarkable results uh, obtained uh, from deep networks. And let me briefly uh, remind you that for deep networks, uh, you have this structure that I'm illustrating here in the case of images, which is a cascade of convolution operators and a nonlinearity, which is going to be a relu, and subsampling that progressively build these different layers that have correspond to images that are progressively smaller with many channels. And of course, you have uh, these uh, weights, which are these convolution operators that represent hundreds of millions of parameters that, as you know, are optimized with a gradient descent in order to minimize the loss on the supervised information in the case of supervised learning. Now, the uh, remarkable results of this is that it works not only for classification, but also for generation and for many different types of data, time series, images, text, physics data, and so on. And the big question that we are all wondering is how come these structure which are relatively fixed, I mean, it may vary, but they, they uh, look very much alike, are able to circumvent the curves of dimension art. That will be the center uh, of uh, the talk. And one first element that I'd like just to observe is that when you go along such a network, which does such cascade of filtering, when you go, uh, although the filters have a very small support, potentially three by three, when you go at a, a higher depths 
of the network, for example, here, the receptive field, in other words, the area of data which corresponds to this value is progressively growing. In other words, when you go deeper, you have a kind of progressive aggregation of uh, elements that corresponds to a kind of scale parameter. And that's going to be uh, very important in the talk. So uh, in the, uh, the overall uh, overview of the talk is I'm going to move from unsupervised uh, uh, problems to supervised uh, problem. I'm going, because I want to build up a mathematical model begin from relatively simpler problem coming from uh, statistical uh, physics. And we are going to see that on this trip from relatively simple to more complex and unsupervised to supervised, there are some key concepts that are going to come in. The first one is going to be scale separation, the importance of scale, which I've just pointed uh, very briefly on the network architectures. The fact that there are very strong dependencies of scale and one core issue will be to understand the interaction across scales and there the channels that we see appearing in these layers will be very important. And the last important element is the importance of random projections within uh, these problems. So I'm going to begin from a very classic point of view to uh, begin on firm ground for attacking these problems of uh, supervised learning and namely with maximum entropy model. So if you begin from a statistical physics point of view, or you have your probability distribution and you have observation, which are expected values of some nonlinear function of uh, the data you want to characterize. And this corresponds typically to the feature vector that you want to extract from the data X. Now, you can build a probability distribution model from such measurements by saying that your probability distribution model should satisfy the appropriate expected value, which are here. But it should also, because you have no other information, maximize the entropy. In other words, the expected value of the log probability should be as large as possible or minus expected value. And classical result, because you are optimizing a convex functional, is that the probability distribution is going to have an exponential form. These are called Gibbs distribution. And basically, you have an energy here, which is just a linear combination of the functions that you've used in your feature vector. And of course, the big difficulty is to compute this parameter theta k that you can think of as Lagrange multiplied. Now, of course, you're going to make an error with such a model. And the error, if you measure it with a kullback cleveland distance, is basically the excess of entropy of your model, p theta, relatively to the true model. So what is difficult in this problem? What is difficult here is to understand what are the appropriate feature vectors that can be used to describe a very complex uh, probability distribution. And that's where deep neural network provides spectacular results. So in the talk, there are going to be three key uh, uh, ideas that I'm going to constantly refer to build up the overall model. The difficulty is that we are in high dimension. So somewhere we will need to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. On the other hand, we are facing, for example, in images or in physics, very long range correlations. So if you want to reduce dimensionality, you need somewhere to reduce these long range correlation to very local correlations. And this is the role of scale separation, dimensionality reduction, and that will be done through these wavelet transforms. The second thing is that once you've done that, you're facing a classical problem in physics is that, okay, you separated the scale, but now you need to understand what is the interaction across scale. That's where the nonlinearity is going to uh, play a very fundamental role, whether it's a relu or a modulus, and that's going to go through elimination of phases. The third point is that in order to build your whole model, you need to 
represent these scalar interaction and approximate them. And what we're going to see, that's where random projection plays a, an important role. We're going to see that these random projection do exist in the learned neural networks. And it corresponds to the composition of a spherical harmonics. That will be a more compressive sensing point of view. So what I'm going to show is that these ideas lead very naturally to deep network. And I will illustrate it both for generation problem and for classification problem. So let me begin with the first idea. Scale separation, why does it help you to do dimensionality reduction? So suppose that you have D variables. You can think of them as being pixels of an image, particles in a physical field or agents which are interacting, for example, in a social network. You're going to have very strong interactions with the neighbor pixels or agents of particles. Then with the more far away ones, you are still going to have an interaction, but you can summarize the in interaction by looking at the field created by the set of all these other particles on the central one. And the one that are even more far away, you can group them in an even bigger group and look at the influence on the central element. This idea is almost everywhere in physics. And the key consequence of that is that you can summarize the D interaction between all particle and your central one into interaction of log D terms, which are all these groups. But of course, the difficulty is that these log D terms also interact between them. And that's the core idea of some of the fast algorithms, such as fast multiples used in physics. OK, in our case, we are going to capture that with wavelengths. So what is a wavelength? A wavelet is like a sine wave. You see it here, psi. It has a real part, which is like a local cosine, and an imaginary part here, which is like a sine, but it's a local waveform. So this wavelet, we are going to dilate it like a sine wave, and you see the wavelets, which are smaller and smaller. We are going to rotate it, and you see the rotated wavelets, OK? Now, if you have an image like here, the wavelet coefficient you obtain then by filtering your image with the wavelet and subsampling. So depending upon the orientation of the wavelet, you are going to extract the edges, in some sense, the images. That's where locally the image changed the most. But whenever the image is regular like here, the coefficients are going to be close to 0, and you see them appearing as gray whereas edges create large positive white or negative white coefficients. Now, one key observation that people have done since uh, uh, the, the, the years 90s is that doing so, you obtain a very sparse representation. In other words, most coefficients are zero despite edges, which you can see by looking at the first order moments. The ratio between first to second order moments are small, which expresses this sparsity property. Now, how does that relate to a neural net? When you take an image, the fast wavelet transform, the way it operates is first you compute with a filtering and a subsampling, and then you compute all the other bands that you see here by computing all these wavelet coefficients, which corresponds to all these coefficients over there. Then, the next scale, you will reapply a filter, which will compute all these bands over there, the low frequency, and that, that corresponds to different frequency band here. And the next scale is again a set of convolution filters that gives you all the next wavelet coefficients at the very core scale and the low frequency. Now, when you look at all these coefficients, the first observation is that, of course, these coefficients that you see there they are very dependent across scales. They are very dependent because all the large coefficients are close to the edges, so they have more or less the same geometry. But what is difficult is that if you look at the correlation of these images, wavelet images, across scale or across orientation, the covariance, the correlation is zero. Why? Because these images oscillate, 
The fact that they are zero is that they oscillate at different speed. And that means in the Fourier domain, they have different frequency support. And you make a simple proof that shows that they have no correlation. That means that the dependencies across scale or across orientation are nonlinear. OK, how can you capture this nonlinear dependency? What you can do is kill the phase. How can you kill the phase, the oscillation of signs, with a rectifier or with a modulus? That will do essentially the same job. I'll take here the modulus for mathematical simplicity. So then what you'd like to do is to compute not the covariance of the coefficient themselves, but the covariance after going through the modulus nonlinearity or the relu. This is equivalent to have a relu. And also, I'm going to keep the coefficient themselves. So I'm going to do a skip connection. Now, once you have all these covariants, you would like to reduce them. You would like to make sure that these correlations only exist locally so that you have few coefficients to deal with. How can you do that? The way it's done, because now you have long range correlation, is to do again a wavelet transform. And that's what is done here. You do a second wavelet transform. So you take your wavelet coefficient after the modulus and you retransform them, and you get these so called scattering coefficients. So it's just a cascade of wavelet filters. And now, if you look at a given point across the channels, you get these scattering coefficient that corresponds to all scale and orientation, but at a fixed point. And the question now is how to capture the dependencies across scale. And here, and that's the question that I'm writing here. And that's where we go to the third idea. The third idea is about capturing these dependencies. And this is the work of Etienne L'Empereur, Gaspar Rochette, and Florent Tanguy. So now you have your scattering coefficients. The strategy that we're going to use, and I'll show that's the strategy that is being learned by Normat, is to do a random projection. What does that mean? That means that we are going to do a one one convolution with a matrix whose rows are independent Gaussian random variable. In other words, you take your coefficient, you make a linear combination of your coefficient with random weights, and then you take your rectifier. Now, the idea is that then once you've done that, if you want to build a probabilistic model, the only thing that you'll have to do is to take the expected value. And the claim is that this is enough to characterize very complex random processes. If you want to have an interpretation, what's happening is that when the width of, in other words, the number of random features increases, if you look at the maximum entropy model of this distribution of random features, in fact, it's the same thing than taking this scattering vector which lives on the sphere and decompose it on a Fourier basis. So what is a Fourier basis on the sphere? The Fourier basis on the sphere are spherical harmonics. So here you sit in three dimensions, but here we are going to be in much higher dimensions. The size of the dimension, as I said, is going to be of the order of the log of the size of the data. So it's much smaller than the original dimension, but still it's not so small. Doing random projection is a way to capture the projection of your vectors on these spherical harmonies. So intuitively, what are we doing? We are taking these vectors and we're making Fourier approximation. Now, is that going to work? It's going to work only if you need few coefficients because your sphere is in high dimension. Under what condition this is going to be true, if your probability distribution, in other words, if the scale interaction terms are very regular. Now, the overall uh, model consists in having these scale interaction terms that essentially specify the probability distribution on the sphere, but also you know 
that your model is sparse. The fact that your model is sparse means that you are going to have an L1 norm of your scattering coefficient, which is going to be small. If you want to view that geometrically, you have both a condition on the sphere, but imposing these expected value is like imposing that this coefficient belongs to a kind of pyramidal, that's the L1 ball. And you have the intersection of the two, and the intersection of the two defines what is called a compressive sensing problem. That's the way the priority distribution is going to be modeled. So this is an example. Here you have at the top the original data. That's again the work of Etienne Lempereur, Gaspard Rochette, and Florent Angut at École Normale Supérieure. In this case, I'm going to have only one image to learn the expected value. Because it is stationary, I can compute the expected value with a spatial sum. Then I build the maximum entropy model from these interaction terms. And then I sample, in other words, I give you sample of your probability distribution. That's what you see here. You get, can get as many as you want. And it's not just that these images look good. They reproduce all third order, all fourth order moments. So they are really capturing the statistics of the problem. Same thing here. These are more structured uh, uh, textures. In these cases, you just have an example. So you cannot satisfy, uh, verify the statistics. And in fact, you can see because he, in these cases, you are breaking the global geometry because here you have something where your moments haven't converged. Because from one example, you have very low frequencies which haven't yet converged. Okay, so at this point, we have a way to explain why that kind of apparently extremely difficult probability distribution can be estimated from relatively few moments. The question now is, what is that going to have to do with the real deep networks? To look at this problem, I'm going to look at the problem of supervised learning and namely at classification. So let me come back to a standard deep network. In this case, you have weights. And these weights are going to be learned with a stochastic gradient descent by initializing them as a Gaussian white noise. Now, because you initialize them as a Gaussian white noise, if you do two training, you are going to get two set of weight. So you can interpret these matrices as being matrices of random variables. Now, the big difficulty, if you want to model a deep network, is that you don't need just to understand what is the distribution of these random variables after learning, but you also need to understand what is the dependencies between all these matrices. In other words, the joint distribution of all these weights. Obviously, the other thing that you want to understand is what is the class of function that you are learning, and how come this class is appropriate to solve these difficult classification problems. So the first thing we did a number of years ago was to say, OK, we have this scattering transform that is capturing the interaction across scale. We are going to try to model these uh, scale interaction matrices. So we first do a wavelet transform, and then we do a transformation across the, the, the channels. OK, and we do that at each scale and then a linear classification. If you don't do any, um, classif if you don't apply these operators, the results are a bit worse than what you are seeing here. If you try to model them from prior information, such as symmetry, rotation symmetries, maybe deformorphism symmetries, that's where we get. We have an error which is about four times bigger than what a residual network would get of a similar depth. In the case of ImageNet, you go from 50% to 11%. What does that mean? That means that we don't have the right models. So for all these years, we've been thinking in terms of symmetries to try to capture interaction across scales. Then, uh, 
two PhD students, Florentin Gut and John Zarka, decided to learn these matrices with a stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so now they apply the wavelet transform in space, and then they learn the weights across the channels. You can view that as a factorization of the weight matrices as spatially wavelet and then across channel, something that is learned. If you do that, you reach the performance of a ResNet. A little bit better sometime, a little bit worse, but essentially up to one or two percent, uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 percent, you get the same performance both for CIFAR and ImageNet. Of course, now the question is, what are these weights? How are they learned? Now, for CIFAR, the big surprise was to realize that essentially these weights are random Gaussian. And to realize that, you can follow the evolution of the weights as the optimization goes on. Initially, the weights are just Gaussian white. Okay, that's the initialization of all the weight. And what we did, did we observe? As the number of epoch increases in the optimization, what we see is that the covariance of the weight increases. But if we invert the covariance, in other words, if we whiten the weights, we come back nearly to the initial point. In other words, the whitened weight look essentially like a Gaussian random variable. If you look at these inner product, they are close to one and very much close to one, given that we are in very high dimension. Okay, second test, we have been whitening the weights at the learning, and we looked at the distribution of the eigenvalue of the, of the covariance after whitening. And they have exactly a Marchenko-Pasteur distribution, at least on the first half of the layers. And on the last layers, there is a little bit of error, but most of them follow this Marchenko-Pasteur distribution, which is a signature of the fact that after whitening, you have something independent and therefore likely to be gauged. So the model we are arriving to are these rainbow network models. If you take all the network we've been looking at, the first observation is that in deep network, if you look at the activation layer of the network, if you look at the kernel associated to the activation layer, when we begin to increase the width of the network, they converge in mean square error. And that's very much related, for example, to the NTK model. But the NTK model, they remain very close to the initialization. What we're saying is that we have the same property, even though we are potentially very far from initialization. The consequence of that is that each activation layer is in fact a rotation of a deterministic activation layer that produces this fixed kernel to which it converges. So what the rainbow model says is that Essentially, when you have these random weights which changes because of the initialization, what it does is a rotation of the activation layers. If the activation layers rotate, then what you can expect is that the weights are essentially going to rotate. In other words, the model says that the weights are Gaussian colored noise, but their covariance are rotated. And that's very important. That defines the dependency of a weight matrix with the previous one. And this rotation matrix depends upon the previous one. That's what I'm saying here. So we did verify these kind of properties over CIFAR 10. And you see that indeed after rotation, the activation layers are going to progressively converge to a fixed activation layers with an error that progressively decreases. And that leads to a global uh, model that I'm showing here. When the width of each of the layer increases towards infinity. When the width of the layer increases to infinity, what's happening is that the random activation layers up to rotation converge to a fixed activation layer. 
So what you can verify is that your network is in, fi in fact equivalent to a fixed network where first you do a wavelet transform. Then you have these covariants. What are the role of the covariants? They are essentially linear operator which are going to reduce the dimensionality of the input. And that's what we observed numerically. These covariants have a very small rank. Then you have the random features, which are essentially bringing you back in high dimension and which are equivalent to applying these uh, uh, spherical harmonics vectors. So you have a cascade of wavelet transform dimension reduction, which is learned, and then your spherical harmony, wavelet transform, dimension reduction, and so on. The only thing that you are learning in such a model are these covariance matrices. Good, but this is a model. So does, is that sufficiently precise to reproduce the result? How do you test that kind of thing? The way to test it is you take a fixed network, you learn the covariance of the weight, and then you reproduce a new network and as many new network as you want by just using Gaussian weights that have the same covariance up to rotation. If we do that, we create many, many networks, as many as we want. And what we observe is that indeed they have nearly the same performance as the originally learned network, much better than what we had before, and with a slight error. And where is the slight error coming from? It is coming from the fact that the weights are not strictly Gaussian. And that's what I pointed out in the deeper uh, layers, you begin to have an error. So what is this showing? It's showing that in this case of CIFAR, the model that I previously argued for, which is you want to do separation of scale, and then you want to capture the scale interaction through random projection, seems to be learned by the deep network. But if you move to ImageNet, what we observed is that the distribution of the weights they still satisfy this rotation property, but their distribution are not anymore Gaussian. We observe some strong deviation from Gaussianity. Some Gaussianity is not the end of the story to understand such problems such as classification for things which are much more complicated. So let me finish on this. The first thing is, on which I want to uh, insist, and maybe in relation with the next talk with uh, Yan Song on uh, um, score diffusion, is that you have these beautiful models, but whether it is classification where you have to learn a high dimension function or whether it's a score diffusion, the question is how come we are able to learn that? The curse of dimensionality is in our ability to learn the score, even though you do a homotopic transformation. And nowadays, all the mathematics is there. Why can we learn the score? And what I just showed is that on a relatively large class of processes, the reason why you can learn the score, the reason why you can learn this probability distribution is that the probability distribution are not anything. They have some very strong regularities, and these strong regularities appear when you begin to connect the different scale. So these scale dependencies, you need these rectifiers because that's how they are going to appear. Because as I explained, otherwise you have no correlation. The correlation appears when you begin to eliminate the phase, in particular the ROLU. And you can capture these scale dependency through random projection. And now, if you begin to look at the weights of uh, these random networks, you do realize that they look like random projection, not automatic, not always Gaussian, but in simpler model, they do appear to be Gaussian. And of course, the big question will be is, okay, if it's not Gaussian, how can you refine that kind of model? So that was the main messages and I'd like to thank you.
if there is any question, of course. Are there any questions? Uh, if you have questions, please go to the uh, mic. Maybe you can stop the... No question. Uh, maybe I can start with a question. Uh, so this is all super interesting and in, in trying to understand what it is that uh, the deep networks are doing and what they're learning. Do you have uh, any advice for like practitioners of how to like what what how can we take these insights and as we're like implementing and training these networks? Is there something we should keep in mind? Uh, yeah, like uh, for like, like practical insights. Uh, Okay. Probably some of the students here are training yeah. training networks. You know what? It what can all we take depends. Away? Yeah, it all depends what you want to do. If uh, what you want to do is to produce very good looking uh, images, artist uh, images, or uh, um, signals that uh, are perceptually very good, it's not always clear on that kind of situation that you need to understand the math and so on. The only place where you may need to understand them is when you are afraid that your model is just copying from the databases. In other words, it's not generalizing. And when you have little data, and that's the case of physics. One of the current issues in physics is that these tools are being used, but we have no interpretation of what is the underlying physics? And we are not sure that they preserve diversity. And in this case of, for example, score diffusion, you had many examples where people were showing that there were copies from the original uh, database. So that becomes to be an issue. Now, in the case of supervised learning, it's, I think, a bit the same. We are in a situation where experimental and algorithmic work has a, have a huge advance over mathematics. So if you want to have state-of-the-art results in terms of uh, uh, performance on database where you have many examples, that's, for example, the case of ImageNet, I don't think that the math are there to allow you to do better. And especially now, the results are uh, most spectacular are obtained with transformers, with huge networks. If you are in a situation where robustness is absolutely key because you're in a critical situation, uh, like uh, in terms of application and your data is smaller, then it is worth to do it. But I think we have to see that in general, the math takes time. So uh, I don't think that for practitioners interested in image and signal processing, Right now, it is absolutely key to understand the math in all subtleties. If you are a physicist, so a practitioner, but in physics, then it is key. Then it is fundamental because your goal is to understand in physics. It's not just to make pretty images. If you are in critical situation, you want to guarantee robustness, that will also probably be important. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Stefan, I just have a quick comment. This is Bill Freeman. I just want to say it was a lovely talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, more questions. I can ask a question. Uh, so one question I had was that uh, this wavelet transform up front definitely adds sparsity into the element. But after that, when you do have this dense random matrix multiplication, don't you go towards then dense vectors as opposed to something sparse? Yes. You go, okay. You go to uh, a dense vectors, and in fact, you even have a, a dimension IT increase, but it remains small in, if you think in terms of the number of parameters needed to uh, approximate the function. Because initially you begin from an image of dimension V, but a priori a function of the image X is rather of dimension exponential of D. So the point is 
you increase the dimension, but you don't increase much the dimension. And the reason is because you are capturing regularity. So you don't have, and the regularity is not a sparsity and you're right to point at it. The regularity here is not a sparsity regularity. It's more, uh, uh, well, it would be sparsity if you decompose it on the har uh, spherical harmonic basis. In other words, you have to think now sparsity is not about X, but about the function you approximate. In other words, in probability is P of X. Now P of X is a function, it's very high dimension. So you decompose over spherical harmonics and we're saying, yes, there you have sparsity because you need few spherical harmonics, but it's not anymore. What is confusing in, in these problems is that on one hand you have X, which is high dimension that may be sparse or not. And on the other hand, you have P of X or F of X. And this is what ultimately you want to approximate. And this is where you want ultimately to have few coefficients. And in that sense, we are building a sparse representation of F of X in terms of these high dimensional spherical harmonics. I don't know if I'm clear, I'm sorry. No, that was great. Uh, and generally, yeah, just one of the comments I wanted to make was, uh, you know, in the human brain between the retina to the VON, we have over 100 X expansion in number of neurons in terms of we're just increasing sparsity and increasing dimensionality. And that's something I haven't seen prevalent in many models today. So that was something uh, I thought was interesting about your model in terms of the wavelet transform up front with sparsity, but then dense in terms of the random matrix. Yeah, the random, I, I mean, on my, my point of view, for me, it was, you know, my culture doesn't come from random matrices. So the reason why I moved to random matrices, and that's really the result of work of many other people who really were the pioneer of that, like uh, Reich, uh, uh, Francis Back, and many people. And at the beginning, I was very doubtful, and I didn't understand why they wanted to have a limit in terms of waste of the network increasing, why random coefficient. Mm -hmm. It's only when we ended up going into our network that we realized, wow, they look random. They don't look like the kind of structure we were looking for. And we begin to realize that, in fact, we were already in the regime of large way. So all this framework of random matrices, really, I should mm -hmm. insist here, doesn't come from our work, we imported it, but I've been convinced that indeed from the math point of view, this is the appropriate point of view to understand what's happening in these ways. Besides the spatial. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I leave, I think it's Young Sun who is after it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mella. Uh, we should proceed to our next talk, uh, which uh, from uh, Yang Sung. Yang Sung. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Yang Sung couldn't uh, give this uh, his talk um, on uh, live, uh, but he sent us a pre-recorded talk. Uh, so we will be uh, showing this talk uh, to, uh, to you guys now and also online. Uh, let's, oh, sorry. Uh, Yang Sung, uh, forgot to introduce him, sorry. Um, Yang Sung um, is, uh, I think, recent graduate from uh, Stanford, and he, he will be becoming an assistant professor at Caltech uh, at C, uh, with a joint employment uh, at CMS and also uh, electric engineering. Uh, and uh, his uh, famous um, work uh, includes uh, scope is uh, the Fisher model and also uh, consistent consistency model. Uh, and today he's going to give us talk on um, uh, breaking the critical dimensionality uh, in general modeling uh, with a homotopic approach. Yeah, my question was made. Oh, okay. Is it, where is the sound? Okay. It's my great pleasure to be here to talk about my perspectives on genetic modeling. I will discuss a unified approach called homotopic approach. In this presentation, I will discuss several recent works that have joined collaborations across multiple institutes like Stanford, Google, and OpenAI. We live in an era of genetic AI. In the past half a year, we have seen so much progress in the field of genetic models. For example, OpenAI has made a huge splash by releasing the ChatGPT model. This is a genetic model for conversations. 
even before then, we already have very good genetic models for code. Given English instructions, those genetic models can produce very high quality computer programs. Aside from text generation, we have also seen lots of progress in generating natural signals and images in the video. This is a generated picture from the Dali 2 model describing a panda scientist. And this is a short video clip generated by the imaging, imaging video model from Google Brain. Those models can already generate new data points with very high quality. Conceivably, there will be so many interesting applications of a genetic model. And it has become very important to understand how those models are trained and what kind of challenges they face. Just like other machine learning models, genetic models also need a data set for training. As a running example, let's suppose we have collected a data set of dog pictures. As in machine learning, we typically assume that all those data points came from some data distribution, which is unknown to us. If we can find a model to approximate the data distribution through uh, training on a data set, then we can generate an unlimited number of novel data points by applying any sampling algorithm to this model distribution. And because such models can produce new data points, they are genetic models. So the principles behind genetic models are very simple, but in reality, they face a lot of challenges. One of them is the curse of dimensionality. In practice, we want to generate data with a lot of dimensions. For example, one picture contains maybe millions of pixels. In this case, the data distribution can be very complicated. And this has made finding a suitable model distribution also very difficult. So how can we find such a model distribution with enough capability to fit our complex data distribution? Well, just like solving any other difficult problem, we can first starting a small, uh, a much simpler problem that is fixing, that is fitting and modeling the Gaussian distribution. The Gaussian distributions are simple even in high dimensional spaces. And once we understand how to uh, do genetic modeling with the Gaussian distribution, we can gradually increase the complexity of those distributions. And eventually, we will be able to reach the desirable complexity of our original data distribution. In this process, we will form a sequence of different model distributions, which I call a homotopy. So what exactly is a homotopy? It's a fancy word for continuous deformation. This is an animation that shows a homotopy that smoothly conform, uh, smoothly deform the surface of a mark to the surface of a donut. Homotopy methods were originally used to solve complex numerical equations. The original task is to solve a very difficult equation, which is hard to tangle directly. In homotopy methods, we first consider a much simpler equation, which even admits countable solution. Then we form a homotopy and bridges the simple equation to the more difficult equation. Then by choosing a bunch of different parameters, we can get a sequence of equations with increasing difficulty where solving a simple equation could offer insights and knowledge and help us solve more difficult equations. So I found this methodology to be quite insightful. And actually, there are a lot of approaches in general modeling that use similar methods to tackle the challenge in current dimensionality. And now, uh, today, I will present two families of approaches, of such approaches. The first method is form as diffusion models. Those methods use a homotopy to continuously deform our complex data distribution to a simple Gaussian distribution. As a for example, let's suppose the data distribution is a mixture of two Gaussians. We first choose a bunch of different noise levels, and then we inject Gaussian noise of mean zero and standard deviation of a particular noise level to perturb our data points. This will give us noise perturbed data distributions. So here we have a total of three noise levels. Each noisy data distribution can be represented using a one dimensional heat map. We may want to use more noise levels, this response to more heat maps. And in the limit of using infinite noise levels, we have a continuous two-dimensional heat map that describes the full homotopy 
and continuously bridge the data distribution and the routing distribution. So each distribution is denoted by PT, where P is a parameter from zero to capital T. P0 is the same as the data density, and P capital T contains a lot of dotted noise, so it is really close to a simple dotted distribution denoted as Ix. And remember that in genus modeling, we don't directly work with data distributions. Instead, we work with samples from the, those are data sets. Given this homotopy, we also need to get our samples in order to train our models with the, so how do we do this? We use the idea of a stochastic process. First, start from our original data set or a data distribution. We have to gradually inject dotting noise to perturb those data points. And then at the end of observation, those data points will contain a lot of dotting noise. They will look like a simple dotting distribution. So the trajectories of those perturbed data points will form the trajectories of a stochastic process. A stochastic process contains an infinite number of random variables, each random variable indexed by a parameter t. And a stochastic process will correspond to a family of probability densities. If we choose this stochastic process in the right way, then those probability densities will match our homotopy of noise perturbed data distributions. And the way to determine the stochastic process is to solve a stochastic difference equation. In general, an SDV contains a deterministic term and also a stochastic term and provides a stochastic fluctuation to the stochastic process. For illustration purpose, I will only consider the following form of the SDV. So given the homotopy and corresponding samples generated by solving the SDV, how do we generate new data points? How do we solve the generative modeling problem? Well, starting from the simplest distribution in this homotopy, which is the Gaussian distribution, we know that sampling is very simple because those are basically random Gaussian noise. We then start from those random Gaussian noise and smoothly remove the noise. This gives us a sequence of samples with less and less noise, and eventually we get noise-free samples. This sampling procedure corresponds to reversing the original stochastic perturbation problem. Remarkably, if the original process is given by an SDE, then the reverse process can be described in closed form using another SDE. Of course, this SDE has a stochastic component just like the forward SDE, and moreover, this reverse SDE depends on the gradient of the log probability density of noisy distribution in a homotopy. This quantity is known as the score function. With the forward and reverse SDEs, we now have the complete framework for score based agent modeling, also known as diffusion models, as the solution to those SDEs are diffusions. So, first, we have to estimate the score function in order to generate new samples, and this can be done by training a neural network or time conditional score model. We hope it can approximate the score function, so we minimize the following training objectives. The inner expectation corresponds to the so called score matching loss, which measures the difference between the ground truth score function and our neural network model. In addition, it has a weighting function to balance uh, loss scales and error optimization. So after training our score model, we just plug it into the reverse SDE, then we can use any numerical SDE solver to find the trajectory that converts noise to high quality new data points. And this approach has achieved remarkable success. It generates images of high quality with high resolutions close to uh, completely randomly generated images from a score based model. So there are more such images of the same resolution so nowadays, with mid-journey, daily to many similar models, people have no doubt that diffusion models can generate high-quality samples. But at that time, when this work came out, those results uh, serve of the serve as the first prototype and shows the potential of diffusion models for high-resolution image generators. And importantly, there is a unique property of this diffusion approach that is, we can solve zero-shot and global generation problems. Suppose we have a diffusion model trained on both pictures of dogs and pets, but we only want pictures of dogs. 
And for this task, we need to have a forest model that tells us whether a generative image is a dog or cat. And then we want to condition on generative, uh, we want to condition on a label of a dog to generate images of dogs only. This amounts to finding samples from the inverse distribution dx and y. This inverse distribution is defined through the base rule. In the base rule, we know the unconditional uh, genetic model px, we know the forward model, but we don't know the denominator, so the inverse distribution cannot be directly recovered. However, if we only consider about score functions in diffusion models, then that difficulty goes away because the gradient of the denominator is always zero. And as a result, the score function of the inverse distribution now becomes the summation of two terms, while in the unconditional score function, the other is the gradient of the forward model. So now, with the same pre-transform model, we can plug in different forward models using only a single pre-trans model. So this can generate samples from different inverse distributions and test the time without task specific training. And one very relevant example of this approach is we can apply diffusion models for medical image reconstruction. And here is the example of CT. We have observations for sinograms. We want to invert the actual projection procedures of find medical images that are consistent with our sinograms. This method, uh, this task is called cross view computed tomography. This is a conditional image generation uh, task. Here, the forward model can be given by physical simulation, by physical knowledge. And we can apply uh, this score based approach on several real city data sets to consider only 23 projections. In this case, conditional approaches will generate blurry images, and they are improved. Approaches based on deep learning methods which require supervised training, they have better approach, they have better results. <laughs> this is our result. So our approach is a fully generative approach. Uh, it does not require pair data set for training, but both qualitatively and quantitatively, we can achieve better performance, better quality. And this is surprisingly uh, exciting because our model is not coupled to a particular forward model. This means they can change the settings uh, and test the time without retraining the model. And similar success has been observed on magnetic resonance imaging as well. So now I will proceed to discuss our recent work on consistency models, which uses a similar homotopy idea. So to uh, support consistency models, we first notice that the stochastic processes used in diffusion models can actually be converted into a deterministic process governed by ordinary difference equations. Those processes may look different, but they describe the same homotopy because there are marginal distributions that as shown in the background of this heat map are actually the same. For any SD of this form, we can find the corresponding OD on the right hand side, which only depends on the score function and can be estimated once we have trained our diffusion model. And consistency models are defined based of this probability flow of ED. The idea is we want to map any point on any trajectory of the OD back to the trajectory's origin in a single space. So by definition, consistency models will be able to generate samples from noise in a single state. This is much faster than diffusion models because they need uh, lots of iterations. And moreover, consistency models can generate samples using multiple steps with trade off compute for sample quality. It also preserves the uh, property of diffusion models on zero to image ID. So, how can we train consistency models? The first way is to distill a pre trained diffusion model. So, given a pre trained score model, we can run the sample time step T and then the corresponding perturbed data point from the data set. Then we run one ODE solver step to obtain a slightly less noisy data point using our pre trained score model. And then we minimize the consistency loss with a given metric function. So this loss tries to bring together the outputs of the consistency model on two adjacent data points on the ODE trajectories. We leverage a target network. To help us train the student consistency model, there is a weighting function to help optimization. 
So this approach is currently the best explanation approach for diffusion models when you care about field state sampling. And in this table, we can show that compared to the previous approach to gradient distillation, consistency distillation can generate way better samples as measured by FRD when you want to generate samples in a single step or two steps. Here are some examples of what sample what those samples look like. The leftmost images are samples from an original diffusion model. The middle and right samples are from consistency models with one and two step generation. So in terms of compute, we only use one eighties of the computer diffusion models, but the images still has high quality. And here are the results of a different data set. Moreover, we can also train consistency models in isolation without relying on any diffusion model. So this makes consistency models a standalone data model on their own rights. The first approach to train those models is to first sample a random time step at a point about the noise, then minimize the following objective. This objective does not require any frequent diffusion model. And again, we have the weighting function and query network for optimization purposes. There is also a second step, which is mathematically more rigorous. That is, uh, we first sample time step t and the rest, we minimize the following objective. So here are results of using this approach to train consistency models from the ground up. The left shows samples from the diffusion model. The middle and right shows you samples from uh, consistency models using one or two step of sample generation. So again, we only use one eighty of the compute for something from the diffusion model, but our samples still preserve high quality. And here are results on a different data set. So interestingly, consistency models can also be used for lots of zero sum with additive tasks, just like diffusion models. So for details of our here, but you can find everything in our release paper. So uh, in this figure, the leftmost images shows uh, the image given to our model, while the rightmost images are the ground truth. The middle images shows the uh, posterior samples generated by consistency models. You can see we can do polarization, super resolution, and imitating quite reasonably. We can also do interpolation because consistency models are uh, latent variable models. You can do a uh, lot of things that scans and AEs can do. And by the definition of consistency models, they are nicely suitable for denoting tasks. They can denoise images, even though uh, those images could be extremely noisy. They can also convert stroke paintings into realistic images using a similar procedure as in diffusion models. So in summary, uh, I have discussed a unified perspective that help us understand many recent approaches in genetic modeling, which I call the homotopic methods. Score-based diffusion models and consistency models can be viewed as instantiations of homotopic approaches. Diffusion models to generate high quality samples allow stable training and they enable controllable generation Consistency models are very much the same. In comparison, they allow faster sampling, but their sample quality can uh, suffer a little bit. So it will be a very good future research direction to consider ways to improve the sample quality of consistency models even further without uh, introducing additional compute and sampling time. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry. It's my uh, great pleasure to be here thanks to, to talk about my perspectives on genetic modeling. I will discuss a unified approach. Okay. Um, uh, thanks, Yang Song, uh, for the uh, for the recorded talk. Um, he just told me uh, before this talk that um, he. He's current at location where the internet speed is really low and couldn't um, connect to the conference very well. Um, so um, if you have questions regarding to his talk, uh, please go to um, uh, his personal website, uh, which has all his uh, um, email addresses and also LinkedIn uh, contact information uh, at uh, uh, yang-song.net. Um, so, um, now we're gonna have a coffee break, uh, which will be um, 
let's say um, 10 minutes from now. And then we will resume with the two more talks uh, later. Let's get the next uh, speaker up. Yeah, thanks for coming, Bill. I know. I think next year we say all in person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no more. No more recorded talks. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have sat and listened to it now on my own. Right. Yeah, it's a good chance to yeah, yeah. to hear. Uh, good, good to see you, Bill. The, yeah, see you. Um, how it could potentially Actually, a question for you. Sure. Oh, um, the first one the next three. Oh, uh, and the next three were like Microsoft. This might go a while past. Oh no! I'm running on two hours. Where did that come from? Sure. So, um, if you can hey. well back, um, yeah, I've been going a while back in my research. So, yeah. so um, we yeah. talked a little bit, and yeah, I didn't really, I was thinking about it because my advisor said, you know, why don't you do this with the Austrian operator? And we can synthesize the interesting ideas on the ground. Sort of um, but yeah, more general. Yeah, overall, and also, I actually have my ideas of what I want to do. Something with my advisor, something that in hindsight was kind of silly about. Before you answer the universe, and I think we can do that. And he tried it, and he tried to do it with his little thing. He suggested to him kind of a good way to do it. At the time, yeah, most of the work was there. You should also do that. Yeah, the Excel did the camps of the Gaussian derivatives, and then you get to the idea of the Gaussian derivatives. Yeah, so the work helped us to serve with that. They didn't have good. In inversion properties, like you, when you made a Gabor transform, the forward model was really simple and easy, oh, and no, the yeah. inverse model was ugly. It always just didn't work out well. Um, whereas, uh, okay, can you hear us on Zoom? <laughs> I think, uh, Mauricio, if you're there, you could go ahead and try out your slides. Last, as far as you know, kind of making it complete set of the complete image transform. Hello, um, yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Anyway, um, yep, we hear you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Let me see if I can share my sparse coding. Yeah. So, uh, similar to what I'm thinking of, we're all in your Okay, yeah, we see it. Do you have any video or any audio that needs to come? I have through? a video. Let me see if I can quickly. Um, in the retina, to the P1, I think it's about 100 uh -huh. um, And you have a <laughs> Does it work? Yeah, we hear the audio. We see it playing. It's a little bit choppy. You might try sharing the screen with the uh, optimize for video checkbox clicked. OK, let me see where I can do that. Um... So if you stop sharing and then you share again, okay. it should bring up that box. Stop sharing. Okay, and then there's a checkbox there, I think, to to share the um, or to optimize for video. I don't see. Let me see. Uh, where should I be looking at? Uh, uh, so if you click the share screen button, yeah, um, then what pops up is a window. On the bottom right of that window, there's a share button, and on the bottom left of the window, there's an optimize for video clip checkbox. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. I'm just seeing like share tab audio, audio, and that's it. Oh, it just says share sound. Uh, Okay, well, then I guess maybe there's a it's a different version of Zoom or something. Yeah, I'm, so I'm the using video does the, play, the, but it's a bit choppy. Uh, I'm, just... I'm using the the web browser, Zoom. Uh... Oh, that could be why. 
but um, yeah. So that would be one option to maybe make it better. Otherwise, uh, we can. I guess it is what it is. Yeah, the thing is, like, I cannot install. Uh, let me see if I can install Zoom here. Uh, yeah. We have a few minutes. People are out of the coffee break, and so we can right. we could try it. so maybe while you're installing that mauricio we could have leon long she are you on yeah i'm here do you want to try sharing your screen just to test it yeah sure Is it see? Okay, we see it. And yeah, you... I can play some videos and uh, you can take a look. Um, there is a yeah. video after. Is the streaming okay? Do you see cho choppy frames? It is a little bit choppy, but maybe not quite as bad. Did you click the optimize for sharing button? Yeah, I clicked. Okay, I think it's a bit better. The, the other thing is okay. that I think you have your Zoom windows on the screen so they appear as like blacked out sections for us like if you have the chat window open or the speaker panel with all the images of speakers do you know what i mean uh not really what, what do you mean so uh maybe can you go to the next slide next slide yeah yeah okay yeah do you have any zoom windows open like a chat window or a window with everyone's pictures on it, the uh, videos of everyone. Oh yeah. Uh, so those are, I think, placed over your slides. So we don't see, yeah, that's better. Yeah. There are a few more, okay. I think. Maybe one to the left. Here? Uh, so there's a big box on the left side of the screen. Oh, now it's covering the whole screen. Yeah, it's this oh, thing. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me optimize it a little bit. Let me redo the sharing. Oh, Stephen's also saying that the slides were a bit blurry. Can you see now? Is it better? Okay, now now this looks better. We don't see the boxes, but the slides are very blurry. It uh, can you try unchecking the optimize for video when you screen share? Okay. Okay. And see what that looks like. Is it better? Oh, that's much better. Yeah, just go with this. This looks a okay. lot better. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, that looks good. So, uh, yeah, Mauricio, whenever you're ready, you can try again. It was wrong. Yeah, I couldn't install. Um, we can do the actual client. I mean, I, I'm not allowed to do that on my laptop. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can just go with the browser then. Yeah, sorry about that. No, that's fine. So, uh, did you want to try it again, or do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me good. try again. So let me try to close, like everything else. All right. Let me see. Yeah, slides look good. So let's see if the. Uh... 
They're a little bit small though. I don't know. For some reason, they don't take up the whole screen. You don't see the, I mean, you don't see it in full. Um, hard to tell right now. Oh, that's, I think that's better. Okay. Yeah. Let me. And now it's giving. Touchdown. Awesome. It's not totally too bad, awesome. yeah. It's just a little bit choppy, but I think I think it's fine. I mean, you get the picture, yeah. Bad. I think it's okay. Uh, okay. All right. So I think we're set then. So um maybe uh Liang, if you want to put up your slides, we'll let you know. Yeah. People are still coming back from the break, but we'll get started in a couple minutes. And uh We'll introduce you and then you can go. Okay. Okay. So just uh yeah. Stand by for a few minutes and, and then we'll we'll get started. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay, now he's uh, went through the break. He said, uh, I think it was uh, oh, uh, uh, two forty two ish, so he's about ten minutes. Should we wait a couple more? I noticed you with uh, right now for what we're supposed to be starting. Yeah, we did do you have the closing um, remark slides on somewhere? No, that can be right here. Seattle. Oh yeah, there it is. Okay, I can I can do it. Okay. Okay, guys, uh, let's get started. Um, uh, our next speaker will be uh, Liang Shi. Uh, he's uh, a currently grad student uh, at MIT and the professor uh, Wojcik Matsusik. 
um, uh, in the uh, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, uh, also known as CSAIL. Uh, and also he's a member of the Computational Design and Fabrication Group, um, CDFG. Um, today he's gonna give us a talk um, uh, about uh, the uh, holographic displays with higher uh, image brightness and the better uh, ergonomics. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Stephen, for the kind introduction and the workshop chairs for inviting me to give this talk. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Leon. I'm a final year PhD at MIT working with Professor Wojciech Matusek on computer graphics and computational displays. I would like to use today's opportunity to share some of our recent works on improving brightness and ergonomics, ergonomics for holographic displays. So what is holography? In a broad sense, holography refers to a class of techniques that shape wavefront across wavelengths to form a pattern. This beautiful caustic you see here is not a hologram, but makes a good analogy of how hologram works. So here the light ray coming from the top gets modulated by the cup through reflection and refraction and forms a kaleidoscope pattern underneath. This modulation happens in a microscopic level where the surface features are significantly greater than wavelengths. If we treat the whole cup as a feature and reduce many of such features to the wavelength scale, we can create the same pattern through another behavior of light called diffraction. Diffraction says when the light coming through narrow apertures or obstacles, it will structurally spread out and form different patterns at, as it propagates. In fact, this array of feature structures is called the hologram, and the dig digital process of finding the hologram that generates a target pattern is called computer-generated holography. So a unique advantage of holography over other light modulation methods is its ability to generate realistic 3D images. Here we can see an optically recorded 3D hologram of a cityscape. Notice how its appearance changes when we view from different angles. In fact, holography's 3D modulation ability have critical scientific applications in all wavelengths spectrums uh, that are far beyond visual displays. But let's focus, uh, make our today's focus back to display applications. We can, we can use a special type of micro display called spatial light modulator to create dynamic holographic 3D videos through modulation of phase or amplitude. This video shows the state of the art results published around 10 years ago. And we can see the overall image quality was not that impressive back then. This has dramatically changed in the last 10 years, probably more than any of the previous decades, in terms of the scene complexity, image quality, and resolution, as evidenced by these latest results from others and our works. This is made possible by breakthroughs in three major areas. First, 3D graphics modeling software have become extremely powerful and handy to create photorealistic content and export advanced representations like light field images or focal stacks for optimizing 3D holograms. Second, exciting new computational paradigms have emerged to improve hologram generation. For example, differentiable optics enables gradient-based optimization for hologram generation. Deep learning techniques also support training of neural proxies for physical simulations to accelerate hologram computation. Finally, the advent of high-performance GPUs with fast parallel computing and rendering have speed up hologram computation and resolutions by orders of magnitude. And the new SLMs with higher pixel counts realize these holograms in real life. Taking advantage of these breakthroughs, we direct our attention to two relatively underexplored mm -hmm. but equally important aspects of holographic displays, brightness and ergonomics. Uh, let's talk about brightness first. High brightness display has become a key selling point for cell phones and monitors recently. For example, iPhone's brightness have gone up from 500 nits in its first generation to 2000 nits in its latest 14th generation. For AR VR applications, high display brightness is particularly important for the content to be visible under natural sunlight or to appear realistic in fully immersive environments. Achieving high brightness for holographic display is challenging because it requires use of lasers. Lasers have strict power classifications due to their eye safety threat. Thus, it is always beneficial if we can achieve a brighter image through a smarter color driving scheme to more efficiently use a laser's full power instead of naively driving a more powerful laser in a higher class grade. Other reasons to not use a higher class laser includes increased cost, 
higher power consumption and higher demand for cooling, all of which will compromise the display design. Now, before introducing our new color driving scheme, let's take a quick look at how current color projection system works. In existing projection systems, where there is only one active display, field sequential color is employed to achieve full color. This method involves displaying three single color images in quick succession by activating the corresponding light source and displaying the intensity of matching color channel. Our eye integrates these three sub-images into a single full color image due to the persistence of vision. This scheme, however, suffers from low light utilization because each color primary stays on only for one third of the time. Conventional display face limited options to address this drawback because one display pixel corresponds precisely to one image pixel. For holographic displays, each pixel can diffract light in over an extended area with a spatially varying intensity distribution. And the refractive index change of a pixel introduces different phase delays for different wavelengths, uh, further generating different diffraction patterns for different wavelengths. These characteristics open up a vaster design space for optimizing multicolor holograms that simultaneously modulate polychromatic illumination for high brightness projection. In fact, what you see here is an experimentally captured multicolor hologram we optimized that enhances achieved image intensity by 80%. To put everything into equations and form an optimization, let's take a look at conventional field sequential single color hologram first. Here we solve an optimization problem where P denote the color channel, E to the IUP denote the single color phase hologram, HP denote the wave propagation kernel for that wavelength, and SIP denote the scaled single color channel image. We optimize UP for each color channel, so together they match the scaled full color image. For multicolor hologram, we add a new parameter T to denote the index of subframe. And now for each color primary, we will loop over all subframes and optimize the laser intensity for that frame, that color, and the wavelength calibrated phase hologram. The sound intensity will be similarly optimized against the scaled full color channel uh, image. Overall, the two formulas are pretty similar, and both of them can be optimized using variants of gradient descent. Here we show another example reproduced at an increasing scale factor. The multicolor hologram managed, manages to keep up with the scales and produce brighter images with our artifacts, while single color hologram fails. Multicolor hologram can also work for 3D images. This hollow image is partitioned into three depth plans and scaled 80% brighter. The multicolor hologram successfully produced the defocus effect and the desired brightness level. We also find multicolor hologram can use fewer than three subframes to produce full color image because each frame now simultaneously modulates three wavelengths. In this example, given enough propagation distance, even one subframe can produce a target image in ballpark, and two subframes already produce a very close uh, to the target. That's all for the brightness part. Now let's talk about ergonomics. Ergonomics can be divided into two perspectives, physical and cognitive. For AR VR applications, physical ergonomics refers to the aspects like wearability, form factor, and comfort. Whereas cognitive ergonomics concern about experiences like realism and immersion. Physical ergonomics is difficult to realize for holographic displays in AR VR. When SLM diffracts light to form images, its pixel array structure create image replicas in high order diffractions. Removing these artifacts require bulk filtering optics, which makes it very challenging to achieve slim form factor and consequently comfortable designs. On the other hand, achieving cognitive ergonomics is also not easy. When forming 3D images, holograms are naturally governed by the coherent imaging model due to the use of lasers. The coherent defocus blur produces fringy patterns with reduced extent of blur effect, making a distinct difference to the defocus blur we see in daily life from incoherent illuminations. Near eye display also need to create a decently large eye box to support pupil movement while maintaining the full image visibility. Without special treatment, naive holograms tend to centralize the energy in low frequency regions of the eye box, 
causing the quick decay of image quality and intensity as the eye moves to the periphery. Low utilization of the eye box will significantly restrict the pupil movement and compromise the immersive experience. These ergonomic challenges have received individual attentions recently, and several works have separate, made separate attempts to solve each of them. Nonetheless, no work has systematically tackled them in a unified manner. To that end, we introduce ergonomic-centric holography, the first computational framework that systematically optimized all three of these aspects. We start by rendering a realistic real-world defocus through ray tracing guided by rigorous incoherent wave propagation theory. <clears throat> we include both foreground and background scene content for full simulation using layer depth images, a memory compact computer graphics representation for modeling penetrating views throughout the scene. In comparison with previous works which use holistic blurring, masking, and blending on RGBD images, our approach avoided various artifacts, including penetrating background, light attenuation and edges, unrealistic defocus, and breaking depth boundaries. With a physically accurate 3D target, we incorporate high order diffraction modeling to eliminate filtering optics. This modeling involves upsampling and applying sync modulation in the frequency domain to account for high order replicas in the image formation. And we iteratively optimize the simulation uh, difference to the 3D targets. From this experimental comparison, we see joint modeling of incoherent blur and high order diffraction noticeably outperform individual modeling of each in terms of contrast, noise, and realism without compromising the use of compact display designs. Now let's further add immersion into consideration. To maintain high quality images over the entire eye box, we have to explicitly model all potential pupil locations. We approximate that by co-optimizing 3D image reconstruction over a uniformly sampled fixed pupil grid throughout the iterations. We also optimize per iteration random sampled random, pu uh, random resampled random pupils with variations in size and locations. The fixed pupil grid will consistently force the energy to spread out over the entire eye box, whereas random pupils will ensure high image reconstruction at any position within the lattice of the pupil grid. This meticulously designed sampling strategy outperformed previous methods by a big margin. Here, the pupil aware holography uses a single per iteration resampled random pupil with no modeling of high order diffractions. Thus, it's consistently impacted by high order replicas and produces a faster decaying image intensity and contrast at eccentric pupil locations. In contrast, the pupil HOGD method models a single fixed center pupil with high order diffractions, but, but with coherent defocus blur. Consequently, it doesn't suffer from high order copies, but produces a more severe intensity drop at eccentric pupils, as well as unrealistic defocus blurs. This live video capture of green channel from these three methods more vividly show their difference. The full utilization of iBox by our method also produces noticeable depth dependent motion parallax in the iBox. In this captured video, the objects move based on relative distance to the focal planes when we translate the pupil along the lateral and vertical directions. Notice how objects behind and in front of the focal plane move to the opposite directions as desired. This intra uh, eye box motion parallax is critical focus cue for human 3D vision perception and was previously not possible to properly capture or observe due to low image quality at eccentric pupil locations. This result concludes the content I want to share with you today. To quickly recap, I talked to you about the framework of optimizing field sequential multicolor holograms to achieve high brightness holographic projection, as well as a framework for jointly optimizing physical and cognitive ergonomics. You can find more details from our archive preprints and my homepage. We believe solving both challenges are quintessential to the future success of holographic displays, we hope to direct the community's attention to these underexplored problems. There are many future works can be done on top of both works, such as combining them into one framework and using learning-based approaches to uh, replace optimization for improving runtime performance. Last, I want to thank my wonderful collaborators and funding agencies for supporting the projects. That concludes my talk and I'm more than happy to take questions.
Okay. Uh, thank you, Leah, for the great talk. Um, uh, if you have a question, please come forward to the mic. Hello, hello. Does this microphone work? Hello. Great. Hi. Um, so the question I had sort of is that in both of these, the ergonomic and the high brightness settings, you're kind of increasing yeah. the, uh, the scope of the problem. In one, you're relaxing. Instead of having three-channel RGB, you now have uh, some uh, sub-channels. In the ergonomic one, you're now trying to do joint optimization for these physical and cognitive ergonomics. Um, one of the issues, I think, in holography in general is that, uh, yeah. especially when you start introducing things like Aton do expansion and you start shoving meta-optics in the middle, the inverse yeah. problems get really, really big and really hard very quickly. How do you yeah. balance like uh, making these problems bigger? You're trying to jointly solve for more things combined with the fact that like holography is already hard. Yeah, that's a pretty good question. Uh, that's also a practical issue we encountered when we optimize uh, for the ergonomic centric holography. Basically you have to optimize because we do time multiplexing. So you have to multiply your images by the number of frames as well as the number of pupils you're sampling. So it's a big scale on top of a single hologram. And uh, what we find is if you just try to fit in one iteration of optimization, it can take more than 100 gigabytes to, to make one forward and backward optimization. So what we do is we use a, a technique called gradient accumulation. Basically, you, you kind of pre-compute small batches of gradients and accumulate throughout the process so you can fit into a single GPU memory. And uh, that's definitely a big challenge. And uh, for optimizing um, this uh, pupil holograms, it takes us, you know, more than a day uh, to get the optimization done for like a, a thousand or two thousand iterations. So I believe eventually it's definitely necessary to migrate everything to a learning-based approach where uh, you have a data set and then you just uh, tell the network to figure out what's going on over there. I think they're having a few successful learning-based approaches, um, you know, either of subset of the problems that we are handling right now. So I believe there won't be an issue once, you know, there is a data set that encapsulates all these kind of features into one. All right, great, thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, thanks for the, the great talk. Uh, results are impressive as, as they usually are from your talks. Um, I just, this is a, a, maybe not directly related, but I was just curious uh, was to get your, to hear your thoughts about the uh, in the loop, opt, uh, hardware in the loop optimization. Um, it seems like those types of approaches are showing the best results for holography, but I'm not sure if you're actually using that here, uh, but your results still look really good for what you're showing, I think on captured data. So Moving forward, do you see like the hardware in the loop stuff? Is this critical to getting the best results uh, in computer generated holography, or is this um, is is it, is that not the case? I believe definitely it will help. And actually, in the supplementary of my paper, I especially mentioned that uh, even the ergonomic centric holography with you know dynamic pupils and variations of pupil size, you can still incorporate camera in the loop into, into consideration by kind of automating the movement of the pupil and also dynamically changes the pupil. Um, and uh, and uh, you know it's not just doable in the simulation, but it's also doable in the experiment. And uh, of course, I, I I didn't really use the camera in the loop, but I use humor in the loop, I would say in this way, uh, where I also incorporate a few correction terms uh, to make the hologram as good as I can. Uh, but definitely it would be great to automate the process. Um, but uh, I think if I have this automated process, I could save a lot of time optimizing my optic systems. But uh, if I have to do it manually, I have to do it manually, but I, I will spend more time doing it manually. So it's definitely great it would be greater to incorporate camera in the loop. And that's, I think that's also why I particularly mentioned in the limitations and future words. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Sure. Hello, uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I have one question about the multicolor hologram. 
So it seems yeah. like you display uh several laser at the same time on a fixed yes. hologram. But I think hologram is wavelength dependent. So how can you uh, avoid the uh, aberration caused by different wavelengths? Yeah, so uh, let me go back to the equation, the optimization slides. So if you see here on the right, um, I uh, because as I mentioned earlier, if you change the refractive index of your pixel, you're gonna induce different uh, phase delays for different wavelengths. So what we do is that we set an anchor phase, which we use to optimize. We, we set an anchor phase where we calibrate our SLM based on that wavelength. And then for uh, whatever wavelength that is shining on it, we kind of normalize it by the actual phase delay it will happen to that wavelength. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I think we're about time. So let's uh, go on to our next speaker, uh, Mauricio um, Dibrecio. Uh, he's currently a, a research scientist at Google, um, and he has done uh, a lot of work, uh, mostly in the, in the intersection between uh, computational imaging and machine learning. Um, and he's famous for um, uh, developing the core technology for um, sharpen and denoise and ambler features that are um, introduced uh, uh, or launched with the Google Pixel uh, 7. Um, and uh, today he's going to give us a talk um, on image restoration through inversion by direct iteration. Uh, Mauricio, please. Hi, yes. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can, we can see your screen. OK, so hello, everyone. Um, I, was, I hope that everyone is coming like a great Sunday. I was really in, looking forward to give this talk in person, but I'm Foreseen circumstances prevent me from traveling. Um, but in any case, thanks a lot for the invitation and for organizing this uh, workshop. So today I'm going to talk about our very recent work on image restoration that we call image restoration through inversion by direct iteration in the. Okay, so what is actually image restoration? Image restoration, the goal is to try to improve the quality of an image. And in general, what we want is to recover an image that is clean, sharper, with less noise than the input. And there are many, many different sources of uh, degradation. We can have like noise due to the low light capture, electronic noise, blur due to camera shake or moving objects, out of focus blur, limited resolution, or like also uh, out of focus blur, right? So it's a very general problem. Uh, and the classical, I would say the classical modern solution to this task is actually try to train a neural network using thousands of per examples where we try from the low quality to predict the high quality target. And the goal is to like find the right parameters of these models in order to success, to do like a great task of recording this high quality target. And of course, for doing this, we need to specify a loss function and in general, this loss function, what it does is penalizes mismatch between a target and the outcome of, the, of our prediction, right? And we can, for example, just measure discrepancy on the pixel domain and then try to minimize the average uh, square pixel error, reconstruction error. So one of the main issues is that image restoration is in general an ill posed problem which means that there are actually multiple plausible high quality images that can lead to the very same low quality observation. And the main issue is that whenever we train a model to predict this a target, then in the, what, we can, what we can do is predict the best or the, the average of all the plausible reconstructions. And we call this phenomenon regression to the mean. And it, it's not that hard to see why this is happening. Actually, imagine that you, you're trying to do like super resolution, right? And there are actually like multiple infinite high resolution images that can lead to a very same low resolution image. And whenever we train a model, the best we can do is to minimize the average reconstruction error. And this boils down to actually assigning 
an, out an outcome of this prediction that is actually the average of all the plausible reconstructions. And this is going to be a blurry reconstruction. And we, we name this, and it's known as a regression to the mean effect. So the issue is that the more ill posed an inverse problem is, the blurry the reconstruction, right? So imagine that we're doing a super solution for a factor of four. Then we have like this per data, the low resolution and the high resolution target. And whenever we train a model to minimize pixel reconstruction error, we will get an outcome that it has more structure than the input, but it's blurry. It's really non-realistic and it doesn't have the details that has the target, right? And this problem becomes more uh, harder as we try to solve more challenging inverse problems like increasing the level of super resolution. So what, we're, what, what I'm going to introduce is our new framework in the inversion by direct iteration that, it, that tries to mitigate this issue. And how we do this? Well, we do this by doing an iterative restoration procedure. And as I'm, as I'm going to show, it, it can be seen as an implicit diffusion process where we ju we're just given pairs of low quality and high quality data. And then from there, we train models. It's competitive on many restoration tasks, tasks and it's also a generative framework. So how does it work? The key idea is in like trying to split the reconstruction process into multiple smaller ones. So instead of trying to directly estimate the clean image in one step, what we're going to do is split this problem into multiple smaller ones, right? And how we do that? Well, we do this by this very simple formulation where we actually introduce these intermediate degradations here denote by xt that are just convex combinations of the high quality x target and the low quality input y, right? This t parameter controls where we are. If t equals one, then we are in the fully degraded uh, scenario, the input image. And if t equals zero, we are on the high quality target. So the goal is to go from x1 to x0 through these intermediate steps. And the idea is exactly that, right? So instead of going in one step, we're going to try to move little by little. And the key intuition here is that the smaller the problem, right, improving a little bit the image, is, is a less imposed problem. So we will suffer less from this regression to the mean issue. OK, so this is the key uh, motivation and the key formulation of the problem. So how? So in order to have like a, an iterative procedure, we need to have like a way of creating this iterative estimation. So how do we do this? Well, we do this based on this very simple proposition, right? that I'm going to explain in, in a second. And this proposition is actually a straightforward consequence of our initial model, this convex combination of the low quality and high quality target. And what it actually saying this is that imagine that you want to create an estimate of the, of the, of the image degraded at time s, given that you know the estimate at time t where t is closer to one, so you want to move from one to zero, right? You want to improve the image. Then, in order you can create this estimate, which is the posterior mean given xt, that is exactly the same as estimating the clean image, given that you know the estimate at time x xt, and and doing like this convex combination of the image degraded at, at time xt, and this estimate of the clean image. So what this proposition is saying that is that if you want to move through these intermediate degradations from one to zero, you can do this by estimating the clean image and then moving back using this uh, convex combination with these very specific weights. And actually, then what we can do is we can recover a slightly less degraded image, let's say, given that you are at time t, at time t minus delta, where delta is something small, by estimating the clean image, and then doing this uh, combination with these very specific weights. So what we have now is we have an iterative procedure where we start from the low quality observation and then estimate a slightly less degraded image by applying this recurrence. We do this till we reach time zero, which is the clean image, right? So, okay. 
for doing this, we need to compute the posterior mean, which is the best estimate of the clean image at every state, at every step t, it's t, right? And of course, we don't know this. So what we're going to do is what we're doing these days, which is approximate this using a neural network. And this neural network, I'm going to show in a little bit how we train this model. This model is trained just to predict the clean sample given a current estimate and the time step t at which we are. Right. So this is, uh, this is the formulation. At each step, we estimate the clean image, and then we apply this recurrence in order to move little by little till we reach the end. So to fix ideas, let me introduce a toy example. Uh, so imagine you have like 2D points coming from a multimodal distribution here represented by the four orange dots, right? So each of these blue points is one uh, point coming from one of these, these like uh, peaks, orange peaks, but with Gaussian noise on top. And the idea is to recover the clean samples. So in this example, we know all the pieces perfectly, so we can compute the exact posterior means needed for the, for the in the iteration. So first, what happens if we directly try to estimate to do the, the estimate that minimizes reconstruction error from the start? Then we will reach one of these red points, which actually minimize the average reconstruction error, but we know it's not a valid point, right? Each of these points is not actually laying on the on one of the four modes that we know our data should be in right but in any case these points are the one that minimize this reconstruction error so here you can see in practice the regression to the mean right so actually each of these reconstruction is an average of all the possible reconstructed values however if we apply the in the iterative procedure here um, in it's a green path, right? Given by the recurrence that we have here that I just presented, we end up converging to a valid point in the data set, right? And of course, this is a toy example where we perfectly know all the pieces, but in any case, it's good to, to, to give us intuition of what's going on. So let's see a real example. In this case, on like 4X image super resolution. So here you can see the difference when we apply this in the procedure with like using different number of steps. If you do, if we do one step, we go back to the original formulation where we're just directly trying to predict the clean image by minimizing the reconstruction error. And you are seeing this on the top right uh, crop. And you see that we get like a kind of blurry reconstruction. However, as we use more steps for doing our reconstruction, we end up getting much more details, right? All uh, right, so we can do the same, but training a model for doing motion deblurring using the standard GoPro uh, image deblurring data set. And here on the left, you can see the input and then the results are crop when using different number of, of uh, steps for in this procedure. And the plot that I'm showing on the right actually shows uh, the PSNR versus the FID score of the reconstructed images for different for when using different number of steps, right? And one interesting thing is that there's uh, this perception distortion trade-off, like introduced by Blo and Michaeli, that actually says that you cannot simultaneously create an estimate that maximizes PSNR or minimizes distortion and also maximizes the perceptual quality, right? There is this disto perception distortion trade-off. So, which is also related to the regression to the mean that I presented. So here we can see that we can actually traverse this perception distortion trade-off. If we do use one sample, then we're back to the original uh, direct reconstruction that minimizes the pixel reconstruction error. So we get like very good PSNR, but not great FID score. FID score is the lower, the better. However, if we use more samples, then we were able to compromise a little bit the average reconstruction error, but we min minimize significantly the FID score, meaning that we get a much cleaner, much sharper, more real 
reconstruction. So we, by controlling the number of steps you use, we can actually define the, like play in between these two things, which are distortion and perception quality. <clears throat> so here, I mean, to give you an idea of where we are, you can see uh, a table comparing state of the art methods in, in terms of like both perceptual quality metrics and distortion based metrics. And as you can see, uh, Indy produces results with many steps, produces results that are pretty good in perceptual quality. They are state of the art in perceptual quality in this data set. Um, and actually, the second method is our previous work that is a diffusion based method that I'm going to briefly present later. But the interesting thing is that there's been a lot of papers in CVPR, like trying to develop new architectures for solving image restoration tasks, but always with the same traditional formulation of regression based that actually are going to get improvements, marginal improvements on PCR, PSNR, but they are not going to, to, to have like an improvement on quality, on perceptual quality, because of this regression to the mean effect. So with that, let me dig a, a little deeper on the technical details. So here you can see uh, in the iteration, right? Which is the estimate at T minus Delta, slightly less degraded image can be done by estimating the clean image plus a, a weight on the um, current estimate. But one interesting thing is that in order for this iteration to be well-defined, we actually need to know how to compute this posterior mean or approximately compute this posterior mean, which is the estimation of the clean image given our current estimate. But in many cases, actually, this is not well, it's not def well defined on the whole space, right? Um, so one way to actually regularize this is by introducing a small amount of noise to our to, to the input image. And that will actually make all the distributions be uh, supported on the whole space. And with that, we can actually, no matter where our current estimate is, get an estimate of the clean image. And this is kind of a, it seems like a technical leader, but I'm going to show that actually has a practical uh, implication, right? So by doing this very simple thing, which is adding very little noise into Y, we can actually make this uh, iteration well-defined everywhere. All right, so what we do in the end is instead of having this convex combination of X and Y, we introduce like very little noise into Y in order to, to have these intermediate degradations. So, okay, what do we need in order to, to, to do this iteration? We need to have this uh, neural network or model that actually predicts the clean image at every time t. And how do we do that? Well, we just train a family of models, which is actually a single neural architecture that has as input xt or our current estimate of the degradation at time t and the t parameter and tries to predict the clean image, right? So for doing that, we need to minimize like some reconstruction error loss. We use L1, uh, an L1 norm, but actually it's not really, really relevant. And for that is what we do is just sample the pair data that we have as input, right? Then sample a T, a random T on a uniform distribution, for example, then the noise, then generate this XT. And then we need to, uh, from this XT, predict the clean image. Then, so we train the model by minimizing this with like using standard uh, op optimizers. And that's it. We have the additional parameters, epsilon, that controls the amount of added noise. So in terms of architecture, we don't introduce any like novelty. We use an architecture similar to, to the one that is on, on the literature, which is SR3 and our previous architecture, DVSR. The key difference is that we use an architecture that is fully convolutional, fully convolutional in the sense that we can apply the same architecture to images of different size. This is convenient in image restoration tasks where you want to process images of arbitrary resolution. So for doing that, we remove self-attention, group normalization, and, and some of the positional encoding. And then this architecture takes two inputs, t, the parameter t through a parameter embedding, and then the input image, which is an RGB image, and the output is an RGB image. And the parameter encoding is actually uh, in, like 
injected into each of these blocks of the unit like right through through an adding operation right uh, so, but the architecture is pretty standard there is there's nothing really 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 novel in in terms of this so okay once we train the model for doing inference it's very simple given that we have like the input image low quality y then what we do is if we're going epsilon is greater than zero we sample noise we add very little noise and then we apply this recurrence formula as given by by our procedure and then when we when we reach t equals zero that's it this is our estimate so i i mentioned this noise right which has like a, i mentioned that it has a key role and here you can see uh, a comparison of different curves this perception distortion curves when we do when we add different amount of noises right so one interesting thing is that if we don't add noise epsilon zero is zero the blue curve actually we are not doing much better than just doing re regression directly right however if we add very very little noise here for example the orange curve which is epsilon 0 0.005 and we're talking about images going in pixel values between minus one and one so the noise is very very little then with that we start seeing much better results in terms of perceptual quality and noise plays a significant role on degradations that are deterministic for example super resolution with a standard linear kernel or compression check our papers for for more uh, for more experiments regarding this but let me show you a bunch of uh, results in different restoration tasks. So here on the left, you can see the input image. On the right, the super resolved uh, reconstruction, four times super resolution using this formulation. You see that it's there, there are much more details, right? Uh, here you can see a comparison with a regression estimation, which is applying this framework with one step. We get much more details on the hair for example of this lion and as i mentioned this is uh, we're trying to mitigate this regression to the mean by moving little by little so again we can train a model to remove jpeg artifacts right and the good thing about uh, this formulation is actually what we only need is per data we don't need an analytical formulation analytical specification of the degradation given the per data we just uh, can train a model by simulating this intermediate XT, right? Again, you, here you can see uh, some crops on the JPEG artifact removal task. You can see that if we do one step, you get a reconstruction that is pretty blurry. If you do more steps, you start seeing much more details. Here you can see a reconstruction uh, for motion deblurring using this standard data set GoPro. Another example for defocus deblurring, which is a kind of challenging problem, where in general it's super hard to model, but it's not that hard to acquire per data, right? By changing the, 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 the optics, for example, of the camera. So, but let me show you that we can actually push these ideas a little forward and see in fact that we can also address task, the task of image generation as a particular instance of image restoration. So in fact, image generation, genetic modeling, uh, can be casted as a problem of image re restoration when we start from a very, 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 very degraded image. So imagine that you have like a super noisy image or a super blurry image. Then the goal is to reconstruct the clean sample from that uh, starting point or reconstruct a, a, a clean sample from the starting point. So in the limit, uh, we can actually take clean data and pair it to, for example, neutralization, right? And then the goal is to learn a mapping that takes from the low quality noise space to the high quality target space, right? You can think of this as starting from a, from from an input that doesn't have any signal, right? The signal to noise ratio is zero, but you need to create a sample that is a valid sample. And as I show, if we directly try to minimize the reconstruction error, well, you're not going to, to do great, right? You're just going to learn 
the average of your train distribution, right? This is again an extreme case of this regression to the mean, right? You just learn to predict the very center of your data distribution. So this is not a great uh, generative framework. However, we can take the same ideas and apply it to this very specific problem, which is, let's say that you have clean data X and you just pair it with noise, different noise realizations, right? And then proceed as before. You generate this intermediate degradation 6T, and then you train a model for going from the noise space to the clean space. And actually, we can generate pretty good quality images that are not state of the art, but are in any case are very cool since we didn't tune or change anything for this very specific application, right? These are like some of results, ungraded results using CLA 64 by 64, just to, to show you that with the same procedure, we, you can actually start from noise and move into a, into a clean sample. And of course, those of you who are familiar, and there, there's been like other talks on this, this is actually very related to the notion diffusion probabilistic models, DDPMs, and other like diffusion-based models. But the key difference here is that we are actually not like an, not we, we don't have an analytical formulation of the degradation. We are just giving per data, and from there we build everything. So but let, let me briefly explain a little bit the difference with DDPMs and our diffusion models. So for those who are not familiar, the idea of the DDPM is to try to generate images by gradually removing noise, right? Starting from a pure noise, then we create an image that is slightly less noisy and so on and so, till we reach a clean sample. And so the idea is of DD, DDPMs is that they model this process as a Markovian uh, process, and then the idea is to reverse this Markovian process. So this is very similar to the framework that I just presented, but the motivation is completely different, and we're coming from very different formulations. So diffusion models can be used for doing image generation by iteratively applying this denoiser network tuned at very different le noise levels. And the idea is to transform noise into a high quality image. And as I mean, as you know, like state of the art text to image generation models are actually based on these ideas, such as like stable diffusion imaging. All of them, they try to transform noise into high quality images uh, by using this type of formulation. These models can actually be used to do image restoration. So how, how, is, how they are done? Well, the idea is that the goal is to transform noise into a high quality image conditioned on the low quality input. So instead of doing unconditioned generation, the idea is to do conditioned generation. So we start from a pure noise and the low quality image, and then we re refine the noise till we get a high quality sample that is paired to the low quality input. So here the idea is to transform noise into a high quality image condition on the low quality input. And this resembles to what we introduced, this indie framework. The main difference is that we do this by direct iterating over the input image. We don't start by a pure noise. We start from the low quality image and then we refine it little by little till we get the high quality image, right? So it's a slightly a, a more direct path towards the high quality reconstruction. And the interesting thing is that exactly the same framework can be used for both image restoration and image generation. So let me show you like a comparison of conditional diffusion models, like vanilla con conditional diffusion models to Indy with the same more or less a model that has a more or less the same capacity, right? And the interesting thing is like in, in, in the orange curve, you can see uh, the different points when we do different steps on Indy and on the blue when we do different reconstruction steps using a conditional DDPM. And the idea is uh, that we can actually produce results that are better quality using much, uh, much fewer steps, right? Here you can see on the left, the FID score against the PSNR and on the right plot, the LPIPS, which is an R metric uh, compared to the PSNR, right? So the interesting thing is like Indy 
gets uh, comparable results that a conditional diffusion model, but in less iterations than the vanilla formulation. And I mean, this is intuitively, this makes sense because we are not starting from pure noise, right? And we're just starting from the low quality input and then refine it till we get the high quality output. All right, so moving on, one interesting thing is that our iterative rule, which is here on the blocks and on the box uh, in blue, right? We can actually take it to the limit where we move like an infinitesimal step delta, right? And if we do this, then we will end up having like a continuous formulation, which is an ODE. And the ODE that we get in the end is pretty simple. It actually tells us like the, the derivative of x, right, is the current x minus our clean estimation weighted by the time t, right? So this is kind of a residual flow. And OK, so why do we care about this? Well, there are many things that we can do. One is do more analysis. It's, it's much easier to do analysis on the continuous world than on the discrete world, right? But also another thing is like we can derive other, discretiz other discretizations, other uh, solvers apart from the one that we started. So we start from a, from a discrete interpretation of our framework. We go to a continuous discretization, this uh, formulation, and then we, come, we can come back to a discrete uh, formulation again. And this is actually related to many ongoing work that has appeared in the past months, uh, including some of uh, like the consistency models that uh, Zong or, like, just presented and other related work. But one interesting thing is our inspiration and our motivation for, for Indy is, I would say, is simpler in the sense that we don't require any SDE or stochastic formulation, right? It's much uh, straightforward and it's coming from just trying to avoid this regression to the mean um, issue. So as a, as, a, as a summary of this, I wanted to, to mention that Actually, INDI is exactly that. It's an iterative procedure that was designed in order to mitigate this regression to the mean by moving little by little. It is a diffusion process, but it's implicit. We don't have an analytic degradation as in the noisy uh, uh, diffusion models where they need to control the noise level. Here, we are just giving per data, and from there, everything is like a linear scheduling. The results are competitive to in many restoration tasks or even like state of the art. And it's also the same formulation is also a genetic framework. There are many open questions that we're currently working. One is how to accelerate, how we can reduce this number of steps. And we are exploring ideas similar to, to the consistency models that they just presented. And another very important um, problem is, that is a very practical but problem, but it's also like conceptually a very hard problem, which is how these models, these generative based models, um, work when you are giving inputs that are out of the training distribution, right? So this is a very challenging problem that we're currently working on how to make these models more robust. So with that, uh, let me briefly um, change a little bit the, the topic and present you some of the work that we're doing at the computational imaging team at Google Research beyond this academic work that I just presented. And for that, I wanted to show you uh, one thing that we, we, we launched like a few months ago, that is actually a, a feature for restoring images uh, on, on the pixel phones. And this, is, this feature is known as Unblur. And actually it's a feature that corrects blur, noise, and compression artifacts on, on your device. And the challenging e uh, thing is that it actually needs to work on any photo, all photos, new photos, no matter which photo, this needs to work well. And this is actually a super hard problem. It's much harder than just improving like half dB and PSNR on a standard benchmarks, because you don't, you don't only need to improve the metrics, but you also need to face to, 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 to fail gracefully, right? You don't want to generate artifacts or undesired artifacts. So let me show you a few examples. This is the restore, right? And also this um, feature 
was promoting the in a Super Bowl, Bowl ad. Let me show you the clip because I really like it. Right, so a few more examples. Here you can see an image that has compression artifacts, mild blur and noise. Another, another image that also has been, the light has been a little bit compensated. By the way, this is Payman Milanfark, who is a co-author of this work and his family. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that everybody is having a great Sunday. I'm happy to take some questions. OK, uh, thank you, Mauricio. Um, uh, if you have uh, questions, please come forward to the mic. Yeah, thanks for the talk. This is uh, really impressive work, um, really interesting. So one question I had is, is when you're training the indie model, how important is it that the paired data be coming, be similar? So if you're doing denoising, for example, that the paired data all has like a similar amount of noise or deblurring, maybe you're, does, it, do the, does, does the data need to have like a similar or the same blur kernel? Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, this is a very interesting question. So it really depends. Um, I would say that in, for example, motion deblurring, we don't actually control the amount of blur that the pair data has, right? Uh, so we actually train a model that has very different amount of motion blur and noise. But one thing that is very, very important is that like the motion blur and the noise need to be similar, right? Noise is, for example, very complex. So if you have like Gaussian noise is one thing, if you have like real noise with a lot of like correlations and color noise, then the model will suffer a lot. So one thing that you can do is like try to train a super general model. But if you train a too general model, then the quality will drop, right? So this is a very challenging problem. And it's also related to, to what I mentioned that we're trying to work on, which is like, what happens when you have like out of distribution data? So I would say that this is like probably the most challenging uh, issue in like developing like a successful image restoration method. So yeah, I don't have like a, a good answer, right? It's like as, as we are moving to more powerful models, these generative based formulations, then like smaller differences on the train data will be, become much more uh, impactful on the results, right? While when we use like a regression model in general, you they were more robust because they had they, they were less powerful. So whatever the output the outcome you generated, it didn't look that bad. But now with this much powerful model, it's becoming like a, a more like challenging issue. Makes sense. Thanks. Hello. Uh, great work. I think regression to the mean is like. The number one problem I and I think a lot of people struggle with in terms of image reconstruction. Um, and with that being said, this is a great work that removes a lot of the regression problem. How do we uh, put the regression back is my question, which is to say, um, in practical imaging settings, you, you don't have one blurry or messed up image that you want to return back to something nice. You often have a burst, a maybe even a short video. Um, how do we combine the data that we do have? Like, okay, I have t I have three blurry pictures of person, or have six uh, low resolution images of thing, and I want to solve something that uh, you know makes all these branch paths uh, coalesce into one nice image. Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that it's, it's a very interesting uh, point. Um, 
Yeah, right now I think that the same ideas can be extended to, to other formulations. Um, but the key thing is like how to actually uh, take the signal from all these different sources, right? And aggregate them in a way that we can actually uh, create a single reconstruction. And in this formulation, it's not uh, evident how to do that. Like I'm thinking in, in like now, but I would I, I think that the the basic idea of moving little by little is is still valid. The issue is that in order to aggregate these different formulations together, you will need to have like a, a better model, like a forward model of the degradation that tells you how these different views like uh, align each other, and you will require require that in order to extract more signal in order to do this reconstruction. But I would say that it will require like some artisanal work in the sense that you need to have like a model of how to combine these different views or different observations. Yeah, it seems kind of at odds of like, on the one hand, you want a powerful generative model of, we don't have this signal in the thing and we want the, we want the hairs of that line back, but at the same time, you want this like physically based artisanal model, as you said, that squishes all the, all the measurements that we do have together. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there were, uh, talks in, in this uh, workshop, like Charles Bauman. And I think that the, there is a different strategy, which is like how to use a pre-trained model using a forward or, or a degradation model in order to create like samples from this posterior distribution. I would say that this is kind of a orthogonal or very different procedure that might be uh, also related and might be a way of like also like formulating that problem in the sense that you want to minimize this regression to the mean. Great, thanks so much. Okay, do we have any more questions? Uh, if not, let's uh, thank Mauricio again. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we are concluding today. Uh, I think Dave will give the concluding remark. Okay. Well, just a few remarks before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, thanks to all of you who, who came and a big thank you to all of our keynote and invited speakers. Uh, it really was a fantastic set of talks. Um, uh, also, I'd like to thank our, our organizers for putting the program together. I think they did a really great job. Um, they, you know, they, they put together the program, they invited the invited speakers, they, uh, put this together with the, organized this with the keynote speakers. Uh, they also uh, helped organize the the poster session submissions, selected the highlights. And um, if, for that as well, of course, we only saw two uh, students who were highlighted from the poster session, but some of these posters, just a reminder, will be shown throughout the conference. So I encourage you to, to, to seek out those authors and, and chat with them, find their posters, learn a bit more about their work. Uh, and so that concludes the computational cameras and displays workshop for this year. And we hope to see you in Seattle next year. So thanks again, everyone. And maybe another round of applause for our organizers.